I read a book recently. It's called iGen. And it's about the, the next generation of people and uh, the distinctives of this generation. And uh, there was a lot there that I thought was good for our reflection, even as a church. And I think that there's a lot that Jesus has to offer this group of people too. These are people that we know this generation, and there's new, new trends and new developments in this generation. And so as we work with kids or grandkids or friends and neighbors who belong to this generation, it's good that we remember and are reminded of how the ways Jesus is for each generation. So let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. There's a lot going on in this passage could preach hundreds of sermons off of this one, just this one passage. I'd like to just focus in, though, today on Nicodemus and that exchange that he had with Jesus. But just first, a little bit of context. iGen is the generation after millennials. They grew up with cell phones. They had an Instagram account before they were even in high school. And they do not remember a time without the internet, like uh, others might. You're an iGen if you were born between 1995 and 2012. How many of you were born in 1995 or sooner? Raise your hand. Okay. And that's, that's you. And uh, if you were not born at that time... I'm sure that you know somebody who was born in this time. 
There's uh, the different generations here. You're a boomer if you were born from 46 to 64. Generation X, 65 to 79. I, I just barely make it in that generation. And uh, millennials, 1980 to 1994. And now iGen, sometimes called Generation Z or some other things, but I like, I like iGen as a title. I stands for internet. This is a generation that has been immersed in the internet. It stands for individualism. This is a very individualistic generation. Insecure. We'll talk about that a little more in sermons to come. Insulated. Inclusive. We'll talk more about those later. And irreligious. Irreligious. In our passage today, Nicodemus is a believer in Christ. He's somebody who believes. He says in verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus believes. He believes in Jesus. It, uh, he is, as Jesus said to him, you are the teacher of Israel. That's a, that's a pretty high title. It takes a lot for the teacher of Israel to go to some carpenter who's from Nazareth and say, hey, you are the, and call him rabbi, and then say, you are a teacher from God. Later on in John, Nicodemus would have other signs or evidences that he really does believe. He is one who actually takes quite a big risk in helping to bury Jesus after he was crucified. So Nicodemus is a believer. Nicodemus asks questions. He asks questions. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? How does that happen? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Is that what you're trying to say here? And then a little later, how can these things be? He wants to know. He has some questions for Jesus. And Jesus doesn't rebuke, but engages the questions. He doesn't say, you can't ask that, or you have little faith or anything like that. He, he engages these questions. He answers them. He seems a little surprised that Nicodemus doesn't catch on a little bit even to what he's saying, but, but he answers every question that Nicodemus has. He doesn't scold or rebuke that. It sometimes seems like in generations past, just when I talk with with um, older people, it seems like in generations past, there was a time anyways, when questions meant doubt or unbelief or a challenge to authority. And so there's some people who are, who are older that I've talked with and they'll explain to me why they, that, that they did something way back then. And I said, well, why, why would you do it that way? And they would say, I don't know. That's just the way that we did it. It's like you didn't ask questions back then. I mean, I wasn't alive back then, so maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's the impression I get anyway. So, Nicodemus is a believer, and he asks questions, and Jesus doesn't rebuke that. He engages him. He answers. He explains. And we have a generation coming up now called iGen. And iGen, this is a quote directly from the book, that's written not by, not by um, somebody who's a Christian that I can tell anyway. iGen is with near certainty the least religious generation in U.S. history. In the early 80s, if you polled high schoolers back then, over 90% would say that they belong to some religion of some kind. In 2003, 87% of high school seniors identified with a religion. In 2016, it's 76%. There's been a sharp drop in a short period of time. In the early 80s, 8% of high school seniors never attended religious services, and that means never, not even once a year. Only 8% in the 80s, early 80s. In 2015, 22%. Quite a jump. 
for Generation Xers and the early millennials, the common thing for them was spiritual but not religious. You know, I believe and I pray, but I don't go to church. I'm spiritual but not religious. Well, iGen has a large minority that are neither spiritual nor religious. In 1980, 86% of 18 to 24 year olds believed in God. In 2016, only 66%. That's quite a drop in a short period of time. In 2004, 16% of 18 to 24-year-olds never prayed, ever. Now, it's up to 26%. The least religious generation in U.S. history is growing up right now. Other things are down to belief that the Bible is the inspired word of God, as opposed to a book of fables, and uh, even belief in the afterlife is going down now too. Lots of people aren't even believing in heaven anymore. Now since the beginning, the Bible, God, God calls all people everywhere to believe and trust Him. This is true of any generation, any time in history. God wants us, all of us, to to believe in Him and to trust Him, to look to Him for everything that we need. Adam and Eve in the garden They were called to believe in God when he said, if you eat this fruit, this particular tree, then you will surely die. Believe me. Trust me on this. And they didn't. It says in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. We call to believe. In Hebrews 11, it goes through this long list of people all through the Bible who who believed in spite of the odds. And later in John chapter 6, it says, Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Believe in Jesus. 1 John 5.10, Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. We have to believe. We have to believe in Jesus in order to believe in God. The whole Gospel of John was even written so that people and readers would believe. That's how John wraps up. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is why... The Bible is written so that we would believe, that we would trust God. Believe. And like Nicodemus believers, we ask questions. We ask questions. We want to know more about God. We want to understand more. We want to grow in our faith. We want to know who this Jesus is and more of him. You can always grow in your faith. It doesn't matter how long you have been a Christian. Asking questions is how you grow. It's how children grow into adulthood, by asking questions. It's how we grow spiritually too. And many of iGen, unfortunately, do not see church as a place to ask questions. This growing minority of non-religious in this iGen generation has some objections that are worth talking through. They're worth discussing with them. They're worth questions that they might raise. So for example, the problem of evil is a major barrier to faith for non-Christian teens. Why is there evil in the world? There's the usual Christians are hypocrites too, there's that. But there's also a good number that say, I believe science refutes too much of the Bible. There's a lot of questions behind a statement like that. Or, I don't believe in fairy tales. In other words, how do we know that this is real and not just something somebody made up? There's some good questions behind that and we have some answers for it. Or there are too many injustices in the history of Christianity. 
we have, there's some questions behind that too. What exactly has happened? But not only the non-religious iGen, even the church-going iGens see it this way too. Half of church-going teens in this age bracket, that means that they attend one or more worship services within the last month. Half of them say the church seemed to reject much of what science tells us about the world. That we just don't pay attention to it at all. There's a lot of questions behind that statement. One quarter of these church-going teens say the church is not a safe place to express doubts. It's not a safe place. Or, the teaching they are exposed to is rather shallow. There's got to be some questions behind that. It's shallow if you're just told to believe it without any explanation. That's shallow. But it's, that's not what we're doing here. That's not why we believe things. We have reasons why we believe what we believe. If the Bible gives a timeline of, let's say, 6,000-ish years, something like that, how can we see light from stars that are millions and billions of light years away? That's a valid question. You should be able to ask that around here. And if I don't know the answer, I'll look into it. God does not call us to blind belief, but inquisitive belief. Inquisitive belief. If you look at the people of the Old Testament, this is how they believed. So, the problem of evil is a big thing. Okay, how does God, a good God, look upon evil? How does he do that? And how does an all-powerful God allow evil? Habakkuk asked that question. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and are silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Habakkuk asked that very question. So Habakkuk is a believer and asks questions. Nicodemus is a believer and asks questions. Abraham, you know, the great hero of faith, Abraham is a believer and asks questions. Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Asking questions of God. God answers him. Let's look at the screen here and let's answer this together. Why did Christ command us to call God our Father? At the very beginning of our prayer, Christ wants to kindle in us what is basic to our prayer, the childlike awe and trust that God through Christ has become our Father. Our fathers do not refuse us the things of this life. God our Father will even less refuse to give us what we ask in faith. We grow up by asking questions. And our fathers and mothers... They answer those questions because it helps us to grow up into maturity. Children ask questions with a childlike awe and trust. And so we can ask questions too because God is our Father. He's not just a slave master who says, do it, don't ask questions. He's a Father who raises us to maturity. Jesus fielded many questions, not just from Nicodemus, but he had people asking him all kinds of things all the time. Here's a few of them. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why do you speak to them in parables? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus took all kinds of questions all the time. And there's really two kinds of questions, aren't there? There's questions that are really curious. Like, I'm, I, I would like to know the answer. You have the answer. Could you tell me the answer? 
You know, those are honest questions. There's also questions that are challenging and kind of demeaning and meant to test. Jesus got a bunch of those too. And Jesus even engaged the testing questions. Even the ones that were condescending, the ones that were pushy, the ones that were really mean and intended to put him down. Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. In the law, of Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say? This they said to test him. And he answers them. Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? That's in your reading, Bible reading for today. The Pharisees, Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And Jesus answers that. John 8, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? There's a loaded question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They said that to trap him. He answers it. Or, on that night he was betrayed. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus answers it. Jesus received all kinds of questions, even ones that were challenging and condescending and mean and malicious, and he answered all of them. He answered them all. Jesus answers all the questions that he received. And the church as the body of Christ, the church is the place to both believe and ask questions. This is a place where we come to believe, but it's also the place where we can ask questions. And that's okay. And if we don't know the answer, well, maybe we can discuss it, or if the answer, we can look it up, we'll look it up. To some questions, the church has very definite answers. We have a whole catechism that's full of questions that we have some pretty definite answers to. The Bible speaks to these things very directly. Is Jesus the Son of God? Yeah. Did He die on the cross to save us from our sins? You bet. Did He rise again? Absolutely. Did He ascend? Yes. Does He still rule this world even from heaven? Yes. Is He coming again? Yes. We have a lot of answers to a bunch of questions. And we're pretty confident in those. The Bible speaks to those pretty directly. And for these questions, always be ready to give the definite answers with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3, In your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So when we have confidence in our answers, because the Bible speaks to them very directly, let's answer them. Let's be ready to answer those with gentleness and respect. There's other questions, though, too. Some questions deserve elaborate answers. Some questions are a little harder. Why does God allow evil For example, can we know for certain that God exists? It's a big question. Does science contradict the Bible? That's a big question. There's a lot to talk about in a question like that. If Genesis says the world is created in seven days, why do most scientists conclude otherwise? There's a lot to consider when you answer a question like that. There's a lot that you would have to say to give a good answer. So for these kinds of questions, let's not give pat answers to big questions. Somebody asks you a big question, you might have to see where they're coming from a little bit to see what's behind this question. Or if you choose to engage, you might even have to just hand them a book because it's that big of an answer. But throwing out pat answers to some of these questions, that kind of suggests shallow faith because these are big questions and they involve a lot. Some topics are vast and sensitive and they need more than just a Facebook or Twitter sort of an answer. 
And then some questions probe what is shrouded in mystery. There are certain things that we just don't know. Or we can only guess at. We have just a little bit to go on. So Jesus said, for example, about the Spirit or the wind. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. We have the Spirit with us, but the Spirit's very mysterious. There's a lot we don't understand about the Spirit and how He works. So, for example, there's other questions like, if Satan knew the wonderful God, why did he rebel? That's a really good question. There's a lot of mystery there. How is God sovereign, but we are also responsible for our choices? How does that fit together? A lot of mystery there. What is the eternal destiny for those who have never heard of Jesus? A lot of, a lot of mystery to that one, too. Or why did God let my little girl die? It's a lot of mystery there. When you get these questions, it's okay to not know and say so. But whatever questions you get, the church is the place to ask the questions. And if you don't know the answer, then say, it's okay to say you don't know. It's okay to maybe look it up. It's okay to maybe ask somebody else. But let's make sure that the church is the place to ask questions. If you have any questions, I would love to talk with you or maybe give you an answer if there is one. But this is a place for questions so that people can grow in their faith. And let's bow our heads and pray. Lord our God in heaven, your son Jesus Christ was gracious enough to answer all kinds of questions that we asked him, even ones that were mean and malicious. Lord, help us to be the same way, to be ready to answer, to engage, or or to address different questions that people might have, so that, Lord, people would know and understand that belief wouldn't be shallow but Lord, that it would be based on your truth and the truth that you've revealed to us. And Lord, whenever we don't know something, help us to simply trust you and to learn to live with that trust in the mysteries that you have kept mysterious from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.